1631 and Europe is all aflame in the Thirty Years' War. The Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus commands his men to take battle order on a wide open field near the town of Breitenfeld. The battle that is about to be fought is deemed a major watershed for early modern warfare. Scholars and armchair historians alike have argued that it pitched two entirely different tactical systems against each other. In this view, Breitenfeld heralded a new era of warfare. Some, however, think that the tactical components of the battle are overrated. This video presents an in-depth, hour-by-hour analysis of the combat action. It is going to explain the movements of individual tactical units and their respective engagements. This is how contemporary historiography recounts the Battle of Breitenfeld. In April 1631, Gustavus Adolphus, King of Sweden, led his mostly Protestant force towards Frankfurt an der Oder, deep into Germany, and closer and closer to the territory of his enemies, the Habsburgs and the Catholic League. The Swedes laid siege to Frankfurt. On the 13th of April, after only two days, they stormed the city. This was the first major success in Gustavus's campaign in the Thirty Years' War. However, Gustavus must have been disappointed while overlooking his men at Frankfurt. They only numbered 20,000, a small number considering that the Swedish king had been building a bridgehead in Pomerania and funneling in further troops to Germany for about a year. According to the historian Peter Wilson, Gustavus intended to have 100,000 soldiers by the beginning of 1631. Much to his dismay, the German Protestant princes mistrusted him and did not join his cause in great numbers, despite him championing the liberties of the Protestants in Germany. Not even Gustavus Adolphus' reputation could convince them. People mumbled that death and devil themselves marched along his men. This was indeed the case as two of his officers had names which meant just death in German, Teufel, Devil, and Tod, Death. Peter Wilson explains that Gustavus desperately needed a major success to convince strong allies such as Brandenburg or Saxony, as well as further German mercenaries, to join him. This was the real reason he was at Frankfurt. In the meantime, one of his few allies in Germany, the Protestant city of Magdeburg, had been under siege since March. Gustavus was too late to help them. His opponents, Johann von Tilly and Gottfried Heinrich zu Pappenheim, were besieging Magdeburg with an army of 25,000 men, while another 44,000 men were waiting to be mustered or already marching to join them. Gustavus was in no position to make the relief of Magdeburg his badly needed success and conquered Frankfurt instead. This worked out all right and until June he actually gained the support of Hasse Kessel, occupied most of Brandenburg and installed a strong position across the Elbe at Werben. Another part of his army, meanwhile, conquered the rest of Mecklenburg under Ake Tod. In the meantime, Tilly had stormed the city of Magdeburg on the 20th of May. What followed was one of the most horrible bloodbaths of a war full of horrific bloodbaths. 1,700 of the city's 1,900 buildings were burned to the ground. Another 20,000 defenders and civilians died. And the city's population was reduced to only 449 inhabitants, as a census in 1632 reveals. The phrase Magdeburg Quarters quickly became a well-known saying used when Catholics asked for mercy and none was given. Of course, Gustavus' propaganda machinery was quick to use this against the Catholics. And suddenly, the Protestant princes changed their minds and sought Gustavus' protection. But more importantly, it pressured Tilly's army to move. The historian Peter Wilson notes, quote, With his army swollen by reinforcements, it was imperative for Tilly to leave the devastated area around Magdeburg and enter fertile Saxony. He pushed to Leipzig, which surrendered on the 15th of September." End quote. While Tilly hoped to win the Saxons for his cause, they had already allied with the Swedes on the 12th. On the 15th, Saxons and Swedes met up at Düben. Gustavus now wielded an impressive force of about 40,000 men. He was eager for battle. <laughs> 
Tilly moved north of Leipzig with about 30,000 men to meet the Swedes in open battle. On a broad wide plain north of Leipzig, he found ideal terrain near the small village of Breitenfeld. It was well suited for both his cavalry and his Dartios, the famous Spanish square-like infantry formations. The terrain was slightly inclined towards his position, especially on his right at the Gallows Hill. This gave his heavy artillery a range advantage. He had his men take battle order and then set up camp. The fact that he had two different artillery positions suggests that he knew how his opponents would set up their army. Tilly was aware that he was outnumbered and consequently stretched out his line. Contrary to the usual way of deployment, he had his men form only one line instead of the usual checkerboard formation. He had four groups of three tercios each, A, B, C and D, and another smaller tercio covering his left flank. Tilly was stationed in the center. On his wings there were 17 squadrons of cavalry, numbering 300 to 900 men each. Most of them were heavy cuirassiers, most famously Pappenheim's Black Riders. Others were light skirmish cavalry, in the form of mounted arquebusiers. Far on his right hand side there were the Croats, who were also light cavalry. The left was led by Pappenheim, the right by Fürstenberg. An additional reserve was placed behind the center under Ervite. They were most likely rather inexperienced troops. By nightfall, Gustavus and the Saxons had taken position about 5 kilometers north of the battlefield. They had already discovered Tilly's army and were drawn up in battle order when they went to bed. On the morning of the battle, the 17th of September, the Swedes skipped breakfast and managed to cover the distance to the battlefield in one and a half hours. The river Lober, which was held by the Croats, was cleared by Gustavus's musketeers. Many scholars believe that Tilly should have held the river Lober more firmly. However, he would have left the high ground and, more importantly, once the Swedes crossed the river, they had no proper path of retreat. Tilly was determined to crush the northern invaders once and for all. The Saxons and Swedes drew up in separate battle arrays. Gustavus had not much trust in his allies. They were inexperienced and not comparable to his battle-hardened troops. The Swedes were on the right, forming up multiple lines. The first and second echelon in the center were commanded by Tot and Hepburn. There was just enough space for one cavalry regiment to charge through the formation. About 500 horsemen were held in reserve for this task in the center. Gustavus himself led the right wing. He wanted to crush the Imperials on their left. Among his horsemen he placed platoons of musketeers as fire support. The reserve was commanded by Banner. The left was arranged similarly but with fewer men. It was led by Marshal Gustav Horn, the second in command. The Saxon infantry in contrast was arranged in a hollow arrowhead formation, accompanied by cavalry on the left and the right. This formation underlines Gustavus's intention to decide the battle on the Swedish right wing, where most of his cavalry was concentrated. While drawing up, the Swedes were bombarded by the Catholics' artillery. They only returned fire when they were within 600 meters of the enemy lines. Gustavus Adolphus boasted that, quote, our guns answered theirs with three shots for one." Unquote. The state-of-the-art Swedish artillery indeed outnumbered the Imperials. However, many of them were light artillery pieces, which were much easier to reload than the heavy guns. The artillery duel lasted from noon to about 2 to 3 pm. The densely packed Imperials took the brunt of the losses from the firefight. The next phase of the battle, unfortunately, is not entirely clear and still disputed. We know that between 2 and 3 pm, Pappenheim and Fürstenberg engaged their opposite flanks. Some argued that Pappenheim acted on his own and advanced without order as he was impatient and of fiery temper. Others say he saw Fürstenberg advance first and Pappenheim simply followed his lead. Then there are those who think Tilly gave the order for the attack. In any case, 
Pappenheim led his wing of around 4 to 5,000 horsemen against Gustavus's right flank. These were mostly heavy cuirassiers. He intended to perform the caracol, that means he wanted to ride close to the Swedish lines, fire their wheel lock pistols, then retreat and have the next rank fire. This would be repeated over and over again. He probably intended to charge home with sabers as soon as the Swedes showed any weakness. For the Swedes it must have been a frightening sight. However, they did not lose their nerves. They met the Imperials at the halt, waiting for the first Imperial rank to fire their pistols, and only then returned fire. The historian William Guthrie estimates that 860 muskets and 2450 pistols fired in one thundering volley. This produced perhaps 150 hits on 2500 men. However, the impact on the imperial morale must have been considerable. Right after the volley, the Swedish cavalry sallied forth, through the dense smoke, quickly charged the enemy lines, crossing swords, firing pistols at point-blank range. Then they retreated. As soon as they had passed the lines of their infantry, the musketeers, who had reloaded in the meantime, poured another volley into Pappenheim's retreating cavalrymen. Pappenheim, however, was far from beaten. He ordered his mounted Arquebusier regiments and the E infantry group to cover the Swedish front, while he led his heavy cavalry around the Swedish flank. Again and again they attacked the Swedish lines. Gustavus Adolphus did not meet their attack, but he ordered his rightmost squadrons and one musketeer platoon to curl back to meet Pappenheim's second charge. The Swedes met the second imperial charge as warmly as the first. Pappenheim, still attempting an outflanking maneuver, tried to envelop the Swedish flank. To meet Pappenheim's charges, Gustavus at Banner feed in his reserve cavalry bit by bit, thereby extending the Swedish right flank. Meanwhile, the Fürstenberg flank had been engaging the Saxons. On the far right, the cavalry made contact first, while the Croats wheeled threateningly around the Saxon flank. The Saxon gunners and infantry were engaged in a firefight by one of the Imperial Mounted Arquebusier regiments. Around 2.30, when Fürstenberg had made contact, Tilly ordered his C and D battalions, supported by Erwitte's cavalry, to move sharply to the right to outflank the Swedish center and engage the Saxons. The A group should extend out to cover the Swedish center, and the B group should act as a hinge for the turning movement. He expected the Saxons to shatter soon, and wanted his infantry in place. Only a bit later, the Saxons proved Tilly right, as the remaining two Imperial heavy cavalry squadrons, Baumgarten and Kronberg, bypassed the firefight revolving around the Saxon gun line. They found an opportunity to charge into the main body of Saxon foot. Baumgarten's men rode by and fired their pistols, but Kronberg charged them with sabers in hand. The Saxons, who were already under threat by the Imperial cavalry and the Croats on their left, simply disintegrated. Cavalry and commanders soon joined the rout. Only two veteran Saxon cavalry regiments remained on the field and joined Horn's Swedish left flank. With the Saxons driven off the field, Tilly could now envelop the Swedish left flank. The Swedes would be crammed in between his men, Pappenheim's heavy cuirassiers and the river Lober. The crushing blow Tilly had intended was suddenly within reach. A series of developments delayed the fight on the imperial right flank. Fürstenberg did not manage to hold his men together. Firstly, the Croats, sure of victory, wandered off to plunder the Saxon baggage train, and many imperials joined them. Secondly, others ran down the Saxons who, on their flight, plundered the Swedish baggage train in a very ungracious manner. Tilly's C and D groups, Erwitte's cavalry and the remains of Fürstenberg's troops slowly moved around the Swedish flank to get in position. Around 3.30 to 4 pm they were ready to attack. However, on the Swedish side Hornet quickly reacted to the Saxons' flight. He pivoted his entire flank at a 90 degree angle along the Duben Leipzig road to present a new defensive position, ordered the reserve of the second echelon to extend his line and advised Gustavus of the situation. 
Around the same time, Tilly's B Group was engaging the Swedish Blue Brigade in a firefight. Gustav Horn had no intention to allow the Imperials to outflank this position. He interrupted their approach with continuous cavalry attacks and his fast-firing light guns bombarded the slow-moving Imperial Darthios in a continuous barrage. When the Imperials were in position, Horn had his left flank anchored by the veteran Green Brigade, the White Brigade in the center, the Scots to their right. The cavalry served as a hinge between the two battle lines. The remains of the Saxon cavalry covered the far left flank and tried to outflank Tilly's D group. As a result, the fight was divided in three separate actions. D versus Green, C versus White and Ervite against the Swedish cavalry. Green was attacked by Karakolin cavalry, who screened for the approaching Tertios of the C group. The Swedes could not return fire because they saved their volley for the Tertios. When the cavalry finally gave way, the Green Brigade greeted C with fire from their six regimental light artillery pieces, and when at close range followed up by a volley and canister shot. According to the eyewitness Lieutenant Colonel Mosham, the Swedes then advanced on them with push of pike and clubbed muskets. The Tertios returned fire, while another cavalry regiment caracoled against them, delaying their advance. The Swedes drove the cavalry off with musket fire and then engaged the Tertio in melee. Lieutenant Colonel Mosham wrote in his account of the battle that even after they had engaged the Imperial shot, the enemy continued to fire at his men and that the fight went on for over an hour. Eventually it tipped in the favor of the Swedes when the Spanish commander fell. Meanwhile, the White Brigade seems to have had similar success in beating off the Imperials. We have no first-hand accounts about that engagement though, so there are no details available. Horn himself led the cavalry defense. He had his musketeers and cavalrymen counter Ervites' attacks with volleys and charges, so his methods were similar to Gustavus's on the right flank against Pappenheim. At about the same time, somewhere around 4 pm, the fight on the right flank came to a climax when Pappenheim launched his seventh charge. Pappenheim approached the Swedish right for the seventh time, and for the seventh time he was repelled. His men and horses were exhausted, disorganized and spread out among the Swedish flank. Likewise, the E infantry group and mounted arquebusiers had suffered from fire from the Swedish infantry. The Yellow Brigade had intervened too and now turned their guns on them. Around 415, Gustavus made his move. He had Banner's men charge Pappenheim's left flank. Simultaneously, two other Swedish reserve cavalry regiments burst forward against Pappenheim's inner right flank. Another Swedish cavalry unit charged the Imperial Mounted Arquebusier Regiments and the E Infantry Group. Pappenheim's cuirassier lines simply crumbled under the flat out charge of these fresh troops. The Imperial Mounted Arquebusiers, caught on the wrong foot, ran for their lives. The E Infantry Groups, by contrast, formed a ring of pikes and stood their ground. Around the same time, Ervites' inexperienced cavalrymen got the same treatment by the Swedish cavalry under Horn. By 5 pm, Tilly's line had disintegrated at multiple points. Most of his cavalry fled or was lost. The E infantry group finally began to crack under continuous cavalry charges, musket and artillery fire. Many of Banner's men had scattered in pursuit of the fleeing Imperials. But Gustavus still had his Smaland, East Gotland and Finnish cavalry under his personal command. He now began to roll up what was left of the Imperial center. Meanwhile, Tilly was escorted off the field after he had been shot in the arm. Some of his Tertios, however, were cut off and could only manage to retreat to the Linkelwald. Around 6 pm, they made their last desperate stand, which probably allowed many others elsewhere on the battlefield to flee. At this point, the Imperials' situation was hopeless. Gustavus and Horn had both conquered the Saxon and Imperial artillery respectively and began to bombard the remaining Imperials at the Linkelwald. The Battle of Breitenfeld was the first major victory for the Protestants in the Thirty Years' War. Tilly's veteran army simply ceased to exist. Many of his men perished on the battlefield were captured 
changed sides or were cut down by the Saxon peasantry on their flight. And while the imperial army was virtually wiped out, Gustavus could recruit the remains of Tilly's mercenaries and came out of the battle with an even bigger army than before. This victory and all it implied convinced many Protestant German states to join his cause. But what had won the day? Was it the Swedish brigade that triumphed over the Tertios? Or was it the single-minded resolution of the Swedes? Answers differ pretty much from scholar to scholar. There is a broad consensus that the Swedish reserve was vital. If Tilly made a mistake, it was that he went to battle with too few men and that he stretched them out too much. However, on many other occasions, the presumably all Tertios defeated the Swedish system. So, scholars are not in agreement about the tactical benefit of Gustavus' style of fighting. However, most scholars accept that the Swedish system became increasingly popular. Only about a year later, at the Battle of Lützen, the Imperials would adopt the Swedish system and deploy similarly. How the Swedes could handle their own medicine is a topic for another video.